harvest time. It's a time when labors come to fruition and rewards are reaped. At the turn of the century, it was a time when men and machines worked together. A steam tractor for power, barking under the load of the long belt. Wagons to haul the sheaves and bagged grain. A threshing machine, that mechanized marvel of pulleys, cams, conveyors, and augers that gobbled up bundles at one end and spewed forth straw and grain at the other. A straw stacker, or perhaps a baler, and enough manpower to make it all hum. It was the crowning glory of the farming year. In 1948, a group of Lancaster and Lebanon County threshermen held a picnic to mark the passing of the steam era. What emerged was an organization dedicated to preserving the memory of the steam age of American agriculture. They named themselves after an early engine operator's handbook entitled Rough and Tumble Engineering and became known as the Rough and Tumble Engineers Historical Association. The third week of each August is the time for the annual Thresherman's Reunion, when the many steam and gas engines, threshing machinery, tractors, sawmill, steam train, and other farm equipment are all set in motion once again. This is the first known tool for cutting grain that we know of. They call it the sickle, but it's also known as the reaping hook. You don't swing it as a sickle, you, you hook your grain and pull it and cut it off. Bring him in the sheep, bring him in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bring him in the sheep. Now this was my great grandfather's sickle and uh, I never had used it before till in recent years. It's a forerunner of the cradle. We used the cradle in later years, but this was the first known method of cutting grain. It's uh, not that hard to use, not as hard as uh, the cradle is, although you can't do near as fast as you can with a cradle. A cradle you can do a lot more, but you use your back a lot with a cradle. It's, uh, just uh, cutting on a smaller scale. Bring him in the sheep, bring him in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bring him in the sheep, bring him in the sheep. This is a grain cradle. This was after They've figured out some easier way to cut than what the sickle was. There's no stooping, although it takes a lot of back work. A farmer could do about 10 times as fast with a cradle and do a nicer job than what you can with a sickle. The principle is not to tangle up the, uh, the grain. You could take a scythe and cut it, but the grain would fall in all directions. Here, the rack catches it, and then it's brought back and it's laid down. It is not cut and dumped. It is cut and it is laid down. That's a whetstone. We keep it wet if we can in our pocket made out of a deer horn, or a cow horn. 
This was hooked onto the pocket, the back and water carried, and these stones work the best when they're wet. It's not a full sharpening, it's just to tune up the edge, to fine tune it. It's, uh, it have to be ground or hammered for the main cutting edge, but then to fine tune it, you use a whetstone. This is a project that was usually started on the 4th of July. That was the day your city cousins and uncles and aunts came out to the farm for the holiday and we cut wheat and everybody chipped in, shocking it, tying if you had two bundles and shocking the, the grain. And then of course the reward was a big feeding at the end of the day. This used to be very regular. Bringing in the sheep, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the master. Oh, the wheat was uh, shocked in the field, and then it's, it was in the field according to the dry weather for about uh, four or five days or a week. He will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Bringing in the sheep. Bringing in the sheep. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Bringing in We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheep. Now, our farm, we didn't have enough storage space for all the straw, so we stacked it, built a stack. It used to take about three wagon loads of sheaves to build one stack. Now the other side. Okay. Now if you've got loose stuff, we'll throw it in the middle. The idea is to keep the center high. Yeah. So all your straw slopes towards the outside. That sheds the water, the rain. You fill in, you keep filling in in the center so that they all slope I'm down. The outside again. It was built circular way and uh, it was up about 20 feet high and then a steel wagon tire was laid on the top on the peak to keep the sheaves together. Now these sheaves were all laid with the high in the center and uh, it stood out in the in the rain, the, sh the stack, and the water shed it right off. Being the sheaves were sloped, that the water drained off. And then, on a nice, uh, uh, cool or cold, uh, windy day, and late in the fall or winter, why, a nice morning, we'd uh, haul the shock, load it on wagons, and then we'd thrash it because we didn't have enough room to handle all the straw at one time in summertime. Now oh, let's have the hoop. Okay. That's it. The harvested grain, stored in the barn or stacked in the fields, had to then be threshed. Before mechanization, this was done with the flail, 
a kind of club that literally beat the kernels of grain out of the heads. This work was generally done during the winter, with the grain spread out on the heavy boards of the barn threshing floor. One thresher could flail perhaps seven bushels of wheat in a day. One of the first great innovations to mechanize the work of harvesting was the reaper. In the 1840s, Cyrus McCormick held the patent for a horse-drawn mechanical cutter that left grain lying loose on the ground. Sweeps were then added to rake the cut grain from a platform as it formed bundle-sized portions. The number of sweeps making contact with the grain was adjustable to accommodate variations in crop yields. But the reaper was only the beginning. The ability to harvest larger quantities of grain with greater efficiency prompted resourceful and inventive farmers, blacksmiths, and tinkerers to produce a flood of ingenious machines and tools. By the 1860s, a mower had been developed that would cut, bundle, and tie the crop in a neat sheath. These binders were one of the primary tools enabling farmers to move beyond subsistence to farming as a business. They're still used by the Amish who are careful to control the effects of mechanization on their lives and communities. These were the machines that were used. Every farmer had a grain binder, or two farmers maybe went together and had a grain binder, and you could cut a lot in a day. Six feet, five feet cut, some even went eight feet cut. It, it has a sickle bar which cuts the grain. Now your big paddle rack here, make sure that your grain lays down nice and even. Otherwise, it might, after the knives cut it, it would fall either way. Where well, this paddle wheel just lays it down. This canvas carries it over to the other two. And those two canvas, it's between them, it's brought up to the top. And then it's dropped down into the knotting mechanism. It accumulates here. This is the holding bar. This holds the grain as it accumulates here until we have the right amount. This can be set for different size sheaves. And it has the right amount in for what it preset for the amount of grain in a sheave. It trips the knotter. And these arms go around and at the same time it, it's tied. It's called a bill hook, a small tying mechanism in here which tie, tie, takes the twine. There's your twine now, and it's down. And then this swings around, grabs the twine, and ties a knot and cuts it off, and also it's threaded in for the next bundle. This releases, and your bundle is shoved out by these arms as they rotate. They go around and they drop your sheave out. It's a very early invention, but the knotters they were troublesome in years, but uh, they really, it was amazing the, uh, that they could make a knotter that would tie a string in all the dirt and uh, grain wrapped into it that the knotter could tie. The big uh, bull wheel underneath with the cleats on it, that powers all the mechanisms, all through gears and chains. It's got all different adjustments for tall grain, short grain, large bundles, small bundles cut as high or as low as you care to. They were used for generations, you might say. They were handed down. This is a McCormick there. McCormick or McCormick Deering, they were the main ones that were used. A basic but effective thresher called a groundhog came along about the same time as the reaper was a simple cylinder with pegs or teeth attached, generally hand-cranked. As one person turned the crank, another fed the grain under the cylinder into what resembled a groundhog hole. 
but the capacity of such machines was limited by their power supply. The tread power brought an increase of one, two, or three horsepower, depending on the model size. Various improvements were made to these machines, notably the level tread patented by the Hebner Company of Lansdale, Pennsylvania, allowing an unshod horse to walk naturally on level lags. A one-horse tread power could run a small groundhog thresher and shaker, like this Krauss Brothers model, built around 1850 in Krausdale, Pennsylvania. The bottom of the shaker is perforated with small holes through which the grain falls while the straw is carried to the rear. Many such threshers were made on a small scale by local manufacturers, allowing the individual farmer a measure of independence. The groundhog thresher and tread power were reasonably portable, able to be hauled by wagon and set up at the threshing site. Threshing still required considerable manpower, hauling the bundles, feeding the machine, bagging the grain, and forking away the straw. But such a crew could thresh up to a hundred bushels of wheat per day. The speed of the thresher could be regulated by the rate at which the grain was fed. Though these machines were a tremendous improvement over the flail and hand crank thresher, they still only separated off the straw, leaving the threshed grain and chaff to be winnowed. This might be done by tossing it into the air, allowing the chaff to be carried off by the wind and the heavier grain to fall. But by about 1840, winnowing was most likely done with a fanning mill. Wheat and chaff are poured in at the top and a hand-cranked fan forces air across them, blowing the chaff out one end and allowing the grain to drop through screens and out the bottom. Like the groundhog thresher, these machines were simple enough to be built by the local blacksmith and effective enough to create demand. But a significant advance was made when blowers were added to the thresher combining the threshing and cleaning operations in one machine as early as 1844. Steel making in the mid-1850s made stronger, more reliable, and more complex parts possible. Typical of the barn floor outfits made for threshing small crops like wheat, rye, oats, and barley was the Hebner Company's Pennsylvania Thresher, first made around 1860. A board keeps the chaff separate from the falling straw. This approximately 1,000 pound machine has a 21 inch cylinder with steel teeth. Airflow from the fan is adjustable by regulating the size of the intake. With a one horse tread power, the Pennsylvania could thresh 12 to 15 bushels of wheat an hour. With four horsepower, it could crash up to 25. That additional horsepower could be provided by a sweep power. This is a four horsepower model, built in Lancaster County in 1850. Horses could be doubled up for an increase to eight horsepower, and there were models for up to 14 horses. The circular motion of the horses is transmitted through gears and a shaft to a belt driving pulley. With this kind of horsepower available, cylinders could be made larger and a variety of attachments could be added. This 1915 Ellis Keystone Thresher, made in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, has a tailings auger running along the side to bring any unthreshed grain back up for another pass through the cylinder. Reciprocating rakes shake grain loose as they move the straw back.
A bagger, not being used here, was another option requiring an increase in horsepower. The straw carrier added to this thresher could build a stack, load a wagon, or be directed right into the mow. Increasingly used as a power source after 1900 were gasoline engines. Smaller two and three horsepower engines were often mounted on a single set of wheels with a thresher, making a unit that could easily be transported and set to work. Larger engines had to be carefully aligned and secured in place so the drive belt would run true with the proper tension. It holds your governor back more so it speeds up more before the governor holds it back. Just a now, how do you I know think how much to give it? it? You just kind of guesstimate that, huh? It's guess. Right? What about this side? Well, I had that known, but I knew that was I would have run it to pieces. <laughs> oh! I would have made the slivers fly. We don't need the slivers fly. No. Just no, wheat. No. Just, just wheat. Just wheat and chair, please. Oh, you got a switch on. Hey, does that cost extra? <laughs> like them? Yes, I guess. <laughs> oh, that's good. Battery this is a 12 horsepower international harvester engine made around 1905 with about a 9 inch bore and 15 inch stroke. Feeding grain properly is critical for a fast and clean job of threshing. Bundles are cut open to be spread out and fed head first over the entire width of the cylinder. Too much grain fed too fast will overload and choke the thresher. Self-feeding attachments eventually automated this work. This engine has a seat for a driver on top of the water tank and a footrest in front. Engines like this and the threshing machines they powered were not likely to be owned by the individual farmer, but by specialized threshermen moving from farm to farm. This all wooden thresher is equipped with a bagger, tailings auger, and straw carrier. There's a cylinder there, uh, there's stationary teeth, and the cylinder's teeth come around like this, and that's where the grain goes through, and that's where the grain gets uh, beat out of the uh, out of the pots of the straw. The grain falls under, out from underneath the straw. The grain plus the chaff, and then there's a windmill that blows the chaff uh, out, and the grain drops down into the uh, bottom of the machine, and it takes it up into the to the bagger. And then the, and the straw comes out here. Basically, inside the separation of your grain from the straw is identically the same thing in the modern combines. The all-purpose Ford Model T could be put to work on the farm as well. The Sears Roebuck Company made an attachment which could jack up the rear wheels and provide belt power 
to any number of labor-saving devices, including a small threshing machine. Straw was generally packed loose into the haymow, unless there was a way to bale it. The upright jump hay press was a means of baling hay or straw for storage or transportation. Lancaster County hay was often shipped to supply the nearby Philadelphia market. It was called a jump press because straw was loaded into a bale chamber from the top, then initially jumped or stomped down. This is a 1905 jump press, originally hauled on wagons from farm to farm, pressing 10 to 12 tons of hay a day at $4 to $4.25 a ton. It was set up on the barn floor near the door so the horses could circle outside. Running the press requires two jumpers on platforms on either side of the press, working hay from the mow into the chamber and jumping on it to pack it down into the box. When the chamber is full, the side doors are closed and a head block positioned. horses are used to wind up a winch that forces a plunger up into the bale chamber, compacting its contents. The brace they are trailing acts as a brake when they stop. Seven cycles completes the compression and the doors are open. Wires are passed through the head block and the bottom of the bale chamber and hooked on the other side. They will draw tight as the bale expands. When the winch is released and the plunger lowered, the finished bale is dropped to the barn floor where it will be weighed okay, and tagged. A well compacted bale could weigh over 200 pounds. Much the same principle could be applied to a baler operated horizontally, though loading the bale chamber was slower work.
Uh, Rough and Tumble has a beautiful selection of antique steam tractors. Uh, the agricultural movement in the U.S. started in the mid 1800s, late 1800s. Steam tractors were very much perfected into a self pulling unit. Uh, originally they were just designed for belt power and they would be pulled around with with the horses and then they devised traction wheels commonly known today as a traction engine. The traction engine would be used to power a sawmill, to power a threshing machine, to separate the grain, uh, to shell the corn, to grind the feed and so forth on a farm that fed America. A common denominator of the steam engine is, is just the fact that we're using and harnessing steam pressure to build horsepower, to do the work. The real practical steam tractor was a boiler and a single simple engine with a flywheel with a pair of traction wheels. And we have here from 100 years old to, to 50 years old. 50, 60, 70 years ago was the end of the steam era. Well, I'm looking for a typical Pennsylvania Lancaster County engine, and right here is one. This would be built by the Frick Company in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. That would be the size, which is like a 50 horsepower, that most threshermen would use in this area. They could run a, a sheller, they could run a sawmill in the wintertime, threshing in the summertime, and uh, and utilize this engine almost year round. This model here was called an eight and a half by 10, which is the size of the cylinder. Uh, coming alone as a 48 or a 50 horsepower. Uh, this is very, very typical Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. The average farmer would not own this machine. You would either have a co-op of farmers that go together with maybe six, 10, or even a dozen farmers would go together and appoint one master, you would say, engineer to take care of the engine and they share the, the costs and the profits and or an entrepreneur would buy an engine and buy a, uh, a thrasher machine and buy a sawmill and that was his business and he would uh, and he would hire a crew and for a fee he would be running, uh, uh, doing your thrashing, doing your sawmilling and doing your corn shelling and so forth. The cost of an engine like that equivalent to today would be if, if you want to invest a half a million dollars or, or $500,000, you can get a, a thrashing machine and a sawmill and an engine. Equivalents to today's money, now we were talking back then of an investment of ten dollars to $20,000 depending on your rigs, but today you would have to spend at least a half a million and maybe up to a million dollars to equip yourself with the right equipment to do this type of volume of business. I got to be 17 years old. I went with the, I joined a, a custom, a custom crew, and we went from farm to farm doing this, what you see here. And uh, with the custom crew, we were, we were uh, thrashing seven weeks straight, going from farm to farm. When you were moving from farm to farm, the baler was hooked to the back of the trash machine, and of course the uh, your tractor was pulling the, the trash machine and the baler over the road. And we and we pull into a farm, 
did push the baler into the barn first, so he was at the back end of the barn floor and pushed the machine to it, so it was set up like you do here. And put the bell on it, and uh, it did not take us long to, re to set up that big rig. About 15 minutes, we could be running still. This was in the barn now. There was another thrashing rakes around that everybody could thrash right out of the field. And the uh, majority of the farmers hauled the machines that you see being, being pitched in there. Uh, they hauled them in the, into the barn and then when the, when the uh, thrashing crew could come around, then, then they'd have to work those sheaves out of the out of the plow again and pitch them in the thrashing machine. A good day's run, you could do about 10 acres. But they uh, it took a six-man crew to run the rig and whatever amount of men to, to work the sheaves up to the machine to pitch them in. There's a solar running in there that you, that you can see the big pulley there. And that's got teeth in. And uh, the grain goes through there, that, that knocks the grain loose from the straw. And then it, it shakes the straw, there's shakers in there, it shakes the straw, and the grain falls down to the bottom, and it'll now you'll have the straw away from the grain. But now you have the chaff and the grain yet. Now the grain and the chaff together runs out, flows out over a sieve, and there's a windmill blowing a stream of air underneath, blowing the chaff away, and the grain comes out at the bottom. The cleaned grain is carried by an auger and elevator to be weighed, then either loaded loose into a bulk grain wagon or sent to a bagger. The bagger holds two bags, one being filled, the other empty. As the first fills, a lever flips a diverter plate, sending the flow of grain to the empty bag. A hopper on the weigher fills with grain till it reaches a preset weight, then trips and releases the grain. A counter records the amount automatically. In this way, an accurate measure of the crop's weight is maintained and the farmer can be charged accordingly. Back into a, a baler that you'll see running there, and uh, it'll compress the straw on bales so it's easier to handle. in there, that gooseneck pushes the straw down in front of the plunger, and the, 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 as the gooseneck's down, the plunger's back. And the, uh, you got to put a head clock in just at the right time, so you have a place to stick the wires through. There's slots in there, those, those wooden blocks, but you 
now you have a place to an open to stick the wire through. That head lock goes along back. It comes out at the back end when, it, when the bale comes out. Now a man has to bring that head lock up so the operator here can drop the head lock in and that divides the bale. And then uh, the one guy sticks him over to this side and I tie him over here. Bring these two ends together. The stationary baler was eventually adapted to be pulled and powered by a tractor, picking up the straw dropped by a combine. A man rode on either side to work the head block and wires. As the internal combustion engines were improved, as the steel making was improved, as the, the devised new ways of making stronger steel rather than the old cast iron ways, they started developing a farm tractor to replace the steam engine. This huge monster right here in front of me is, is uh, an early example of the first tractors that replaced these steam engines. Altman Taylor Company, they built thrashers, they built steam engines, and they also helped to develop the, the uh, internal combustion tractor. This is typically the wheels, uh, maybe the chassis of a steam engine replaced with an internal combustion engine. You get rid of the boiler, you get a little more compact, and there's less work. You don't need a water man. You still need the fuel, of course, but it burnt kerosene, which was easier to haul in tanks and barrels than it was to haul all that wood or coal. Steam engines typically did not have much larger wheel than this, and some were much smaller, but this, this wheels are, are seven foot high, which is one of the largest ones that I know of. So it's a huge, huge tractor. However, it was an improvement on the steam engine because you need one operator for this tractor, where the steam engine needed an operator called an engineer. Uh, he needed a water man who brought him water, and he, the water man sometimes needed another helper to bring him fuel, which was chopping wood or sawing wood, buzzing wood, or they would use coal. So this was the first step to uh, get away from the huge human energy need to service that steam engine. And of course there's other companies. Right next to this one is an oil pool, I think. Here is an early example. I don't know the exact date, but the 1911 or 12, they had built this one. Again, this is steam engine type wheels. They put a frame around it, get rid of the boiler, and put an engine in there, and now you have a tractor. This company, the uh, Rumley Company, bought several other companies and kept improving their tractors until we have the one over here on my left. That was one of the later ones that they built. That's a, a sample that is uh, 60 horsepower, which is enclosed gears, a gearbox with three forward speeds, and, uh, and the technology from that, this one to that one is a 20 year span and huge, huge improvements. This tractor here will pull 10 plows down through a farmer's field at a nice walking pace. It'll also run a sawmill, it'll run a, a thrasher, what have you. Uh, the next step to this, we get into pull along combines, we get into diesel tractors and that type of thing. Right now, what you're seeing running the thrashing machine is a 30, 60 oil pull tractor. Uh, they were the greatest thing that came to this part of the country or anywhere to replace the steam engine in the sawmills, and for thrashing, now what we're looking at is the front of the uh, thrashing machine where you see one of the mechanical feeders working and you'll see them two fellows thrown in there and lay them on there. You see she's going in like that. It don't take long to, to thrash a few bushels of wheat. Now this, you know, this machine that they're putting it in there to had a 20 horsepower tractor on that, you wouldn't get very far. You couldn't feed like that, but it takes 50 to 60 horsepower 
at their crash rate uh, at that speed. You'll see those knives cutting the bands on the uh, shades, but it's also spreading the wheat out so that it don't all hit the cylinder at the same spot. It spreads it out. There's spreaders in there, and then it goes down through over a shaft that also spreads your grain and wheat out so that it don't all hit the cylinder at the same spot. It makes it uh, trash much cleaner that way. This is the cylinder shaft. So everything on that cylinder shaft there is probably on an 800 to 1,000 RPM. And that's where the wheat goes in and uh, spread out on the feeder and it knocks the wheat out of, the, uh, out of all the heads of the straw. You will see there uh, the shaker of the, what you call a pan below the strings and the sieve. And that's what's shaking the wheat back and it's separating the wheat and the chaff and the straw and whatever else, any other dirt that's in there so that uh, we get the wheat coming out real clean. And uh, where uh, Ferris is setting up there, between here and there is where the uh, fan is that creates all the air to uh, separate the uh, chaff and the wheat. Looking at the uh, Part that shows you that where we have the thrash machine setting level. Well, the thrash machine has to set level so that we have the train and the saw and the other stuff all spread out over the full width of the, of the shaker. Right here you see the number of strokes per minute that's on the shaker inside that takes the straw back and forth. Uh, move the straw back and forth and separate the stuff. And what you're seeing here now is all the building. One comes from the main cylinder, which is coming through from the other side of the machine from direct from the tractor. This one runs a shaker there. This runs the, sh the lower one runs the shaker for the pan that uh, separates the wheat. And then there's another one that takes the auger, takes the tailings over, and uh, takes it up to uh, come back. This part right here is what, is what takes the head back up and goes down over the cylinder to uh, re -thrash. It's all the you know, uh, wheat that didn't get thrashed out the first time going through so fast. Look up there at the uh, bagger. They don't jump until there's enough wheat goes in there to tip the scale, and then it dumps uh, wheat in here to the back and goes in the back. All of these are improvements of all what we've seen so far today with the uh, evolution of the, of the crash machine and uh, what we now use the combine to do all of that with now. From the back end of the, of the machine you'll see them uh, bagging the wheat and that's, uh, that's clean wheat. That's what's coming out of uh, the crasher here. And, uh, it don't come out that fast, they need two men to do it, but uh, there's two men on there right now doing it and uh, to get it all bagged up there. You'll see that we're still a little weak once in a while, so we gotta, we got to gather it up. Now, that's about the way that the uh, people from pressure, when they lower the cans, they gather it up and sort it out the biggest grains to bring along so that they had the, the best wheat for it. <laughs> what you're looking at there now is a uh, belt boy and uh, fan housing of what's blowing all this straw back that blow, ordinarily blows the straw in the now. Well, here, here you're seeing the straw coming down from the top and the chaff coming up from the bottom all going into the big fan that blows the wheat back in the now, the straw back in the now or else out on the straw stack when you build a straw stack. What you're looking at now is the straw coming out of the machine and also the chaff and everything together. You'll see that there's very little dust around the machine because all of the uh, vacuum that's made by that fan running to blow this straw sucks all your dust right back away from the cylinder and right through the machine and comes out here. Now when they used to put this straw in the now for uh, bedding for the winter, they would put mules or horses up in the now to tramp it down and the water on there would keep the dust down so they could keep the mules in the field, in the barn, in the now to tramp it.
small gas engines still had a place, even as massive threshing machines and tractors were turning out tens of thousands of bushels of grain a season. At the other end of the scale, the small farmer might use an outfit like this to mill a little grain for his own family's use. The technology of the American harvest continued to evolve as enterprising manufacturers worked to meet the demands of farmers for greater production. If tractors were available, they might be used to pull a binder. But the future lay with the combine, a single machine that would both harvest and thresh in one operation. This tractor, an earlier model, came out in the mid-30s. This particular tractor is a 44. Uh, the difference was that the older one didn't have the streamlined drill and hood and the gas tank. It was more straight. But it was basically the same tractor. Uh, this one had a few improvements, but it didn't have any different power. This was what they called a full two-plow tractor. And it... Uh, the combine was basically made for this tractor. They, uh, the company made it with that in mind. There's lots of them sold that weren't used on an Alice Chalmers tractor, but nevertheless that was what they were made for. And this combine also came out in the mid-30s. Uh, I don't have an exact year on this particular one, but uh, they were really the first what I would call farmer's combine, that there was. I mean, there was people did custom work with them, but this was a machine that a man that had a good sized farm could buy and didn't cost too much money and would do the job. Well, this one here, it was, it was working under adverse conditions. It would be very rare that you ever cut wheat that looked like this. One thing they had that some of them didn't have, they had to change all kinds of things for different crops. This has a thing here you turn that crank, changes the speed of the cylinder, and also you can change the clearance in the cylinder. And this machine would thrash practically anything that you could cut. It, it would thrash uh, even orchard grass seed, bluegrass seed, and then the bigger stuff, soybeans, buckwheat, anything like that that came along. And uh, in fact, it appears to here like it'll even thrash thistles, which I believe it did. And this reel, that was one thing too that was different between this and another machine. This reel runs off the far wheel only when you're moving. Most all the other machines, when you throw them in gear and the machine's running, the reel runs all the time, continually. And it has, runs at a set speed. While this reel 
runs, the faster you're moving, the faster the reel runs. And if you're moving real slow, then the reel runs slow. It, uh, it really works good. Uh, I've used other machines that had the other type reel, and I far prefer this reel here. coming out the end of this auger on this bin. Other units uh, sometimes had a bagging attachment on it that farmers would have bagged their grain in two bushel grain sacks and dropped them as they filled them on the field and later on they would have picked them up and uh, took them to the feed mill. It was nice with this particular machine to have the, uh, the uh, bin attachment it helped one man be much more productive in his operation. With the bagging attachment on a, on a combine, it took at least two persons. One person to drive the machine and another person to run the, and operate the bagger. These machines were used at a period of time from 1941 through to the 1950s. After the 1950s, self-propelled combines became more and more part of the uh, farming scene to increase productivity per man. A pull-along combine can still serve the needs of a farmer working small fields. Their advantages were clear. No twine to buy, no shocking, no threshing, and no extra men to pay and feed. once a season of communal labor and fellowship is now primarily one man and a self-propelled machine. Along the way, we can trace a timeline of innovations as resourceful men transformed agriculture into an industry, replacing manpower with machines, feeding the workforce of an increasingly industrialized nation. It is a past we do well to recall as we reap the harvest of their labors. Thank mm -hmm. you.